Kia ora koutou. Uh, my name is Tara Murray. Um, I'm a science advisor at the Department of Conservation. So I'm going to talk to you today about, um, I've called it intentionally land-based invertebrate monitoring because I'm trying to get away from the terrestrial, aquatic, you know, what's what, because most of the invertebrates actually are in both of those realms. I've, over the years, finally come up with just calling it land-based because that's where the particular... Um, traps are. Some years ago I started getting questions about how do we measure the biodiversity of various ecosystems, just braided rivers for today. I guess the first question that comes to mind is like why would we want to measure biodiversity in a braided river? And obviously, I mean you all know this, um, we kind of we want to be able to demonstrate relative changes, usually in terms of things like trends over time as a result of things like environmental change, climate change, what whatever. And also from Doc's perspective, the outcome of, of any management interventions that we might do. But we talk about, you know, we often have these terms biodiversity um, when we talk about our, our strategies and our policies and our frameworks. We always talk about biodiversity or maybe even ecological integrity. And ecological integrity is a term that, you, that um, I've come across a lot in DOC as well around our biodiversity assessment frameworks. And biodiversity is a key part of ecological integrity. So I, I think it's really important to get a handle on um, what the biodiversity is. And then we have to think about, well, how do we do that? And the first question is, well, what species are we, what things are we going to look at? What are we going to look for? And then what kind of methods and devices and practical stuff are we going to use? Uh, that spatial and temporal design, how are we actually going to deploy this? And then like, what kind of data are we using and how are we going to turn that into metrics that we can actually look at trends over time or, or changes um, in response to interventions? Uh, and I also put how to interpret results on there because actually I think, you know, we often forget about that. Like, <laughs> I'll end up with a whole lot of data and it can be quite difficult to understand what it means. I'm thinking a little bit about that too. In terms of biodiversity and what should we measure, um, this is normally where I buckle and say bugs are important because birds eat them. I decided I'm not going to say that this year, <laughs> even though I just did. Um, but basically, <laughs> it's not really why I look at bugs. I think they, um, if we want to measure biodiversity, then we need to remember what biodiversity is. And I, I picked this picture. It's awfully big on the screen, which is fantastic. But invertebrates make up something like 80% of all multicellular organisms, you know, and they're in all ecosystems, basically. So if we're not measuring invertebrates, we're actually not capturing most biodiversity. And, you know, maybe they're not as important in some senses, but, you know, they're still biodiversity, and we should have a, a more interest in what they're doing. So this is actually called a species scape. This is um, from Quinton Wheeler back in the 1990s. Um, and, and the size of each of those taxonomic groups kind of represents, you know, the amount of biomass they uh, represent on the planet. It's not perfect. There's been a bit of argument about the details, but you get the picture. Big beetle. <laughs> Um, and some real world example of this. So this is just one example. This is the Tasman River. And back in 2005-ish, Project River Recovery up in Twizel did some really cool work where they monitored invertebrates in just one of the vegetation communities. They split Chris Wilmore's work some years earlier than that had split up into 11 vegetation communities. They looked at just one, the Raulia community. And through the sampling of invertebrates, we found over 919 different species, and that was extrapolated out to some of the models suggested that's probably about 1,200 species based on that sampling. If you compare that to the other taxa types in that system, um, there's about 113 plants, mosses and lichens in that same vegetation community where the sampling was done. I guessed at the other numbers, but um, the orders of magnitude should be right. So there's probably less than 30 native birds, around maybe five-ish native fish and, and three reptiles. All of those other things are not necessarily going to predict what's happening with the invertebrate biodiversity either. The Tasman study also gave us a bit of a hint about, well, what can we, um, how could we set up a standard monitoring method for invertebrates in other rivers? So that was kind of one of the key things that I wanted to look at. Um, so that particular study had five different collection types, um, all of these plus hand collection. And you can just see the numbers of different species that were detected using each of those types. So for the studies that I'm going to be talking about today, we actually slimmed that down to just looking at two types, the malaise traps and the pitfall traps. Um, that gets you the bulk of the biodiversity, takes some of the complexity um, out of the trapping process as well. 
and so we ended up looking, over time we've looked at three rivers. We've got the Cass, um, this is exactly the same place Holly was working. In fact, she's used some of the data. So upland, nice, pristine, not very weedy river. Uh, we've got the Ashley, which is lowland, a bit more weedy and constrained. And then you've got the Aparima down in Southland, which some of which looks like that, much more constrained. And in each of those, we've got one malaise. We had a set of lines of, for trapping methods of one malaise trap, which is the tenth thing you can see there, and then five of these little pitfall traps. The malaise traps I picked because you get a lot of biodiversity. You also get a lot of species, like individuals to count, which is a pain. Um, but they also bridge that gap between the terrestrial and the aquatic as well. So you will get all those adults of the aquatic species, what we call aquatic species, um, coming out and, and often getting caught in those. The pitfalls I like because that's kind of you get you can be more confident that you're getting the local situation. So your malaise traps might get stuff blown in from quite a distance and you don't know how far. But the pitfalls, the stuff is coming in locally and potentially being affected much more locally. So it's a balancing act. That's just a close up of our little pitfall. In setting up, we had three lines of these traps on the cask, it's smaller. And on the Ashley and the Aparima, we actually added in, uh, we actually had six sets of lines. And we put in the Aparima half of them in an area that was later going to be used for gravel extraction. So we were hoping to set up for a before and after comparison. We haven't got the after yet, hasn't happened. Uh, in the Ashley, we set up half of our lines in an area where they were doing mechanical weed control. So from um, Nick's talk earlier, that had these years where there hadn't been uh, many big floods and they were getting a bit worried about the, the weeds. They'd gone in and started doing this mechanical weed control and we piggybacked a bit on that by choosing those sites for half of our lines, hoping that we would get a before and a, a, like a, a, some idea of some of the drivers behind the numbers and diversity of insects that we saw at the different sites. But nature, of course, does what it wants. And um, even at the end of the very first flood sampling season, we ended up with kind of bank-to-bank -bank floods. Um, you can see a uh, our site down in the bottom corner there, that's the weeds coming back up after the mechanical weeding later in the summer. We had bank to bank flooding. So that the weed, no weed comparison of our study kind of got knocked on the head fairly quickly because the river just kept coming in and doing what rivers do. And this is, I think Judith and Nick retrieving one of our malaise traps on one of our flooding events. It seemed to happen most years in the end, which is kind of good. So we've kind of got, this is our how we're going to think about um, you know, testing our standard monitoring method for our invertebrates. A couple of little things I haven't said. So data-wise, we took all of our invertebrates and we ID them as closely or as specifically as possible. So down to species where we could. If we couldn't name them, we just gave them a um, called a recognizable taxonomic unit name. So we named them at the, the you know the most specific level of taxonomy could. So it might be genus one. But that gave us the finest grain data that we could get. And that allowed us to be able to play with things like um, relative abundance in different times and places and diversity and functional diversity of those invertebrates. I didn't look at biomass. I actually intentionally decided, for one, I didn't have mo enough money to do it as well. But I also wouldn't want to because I'm not, I don't think you get the information you need out of biomass in terms of, you know, how healthy or not your river might be. Um, you can have big outbreaks of very um, common invertebrate species that can, you know, collectively be a huge amount of biomass, but it might be a few species and it might be species that do really, really well in unhealthy environments. So um, we stayed away from that one. So I'll give you a few um, results, not too many. There's far too much to go into. So this is just the mean abundance um, per sampling line. So the one malaise trap and the five pitfalls. Um, and I've given you this because um, we had completely different sampling effort on the three rivers at the, end, at the end of the study. So we've had to correct it for that. 91 odd thousand specimens in the bigger than two millimeter size class that we bothered to ID. Um, that's pretty standard for bug work. <laughs> so I, I don't think that's too um, daunting. And as you would expect, you've got a lot more stuff in malaise traps than you do in pitfall traps. They just collect, they've got a lot of surface area, they collect a, a lot more invertebrates. And you can see the differences between the three rivers. I think um, I think if you add those bars up, the Aparima had the highest, followed by the Cash and the Ashley were very, very similar in terms of their abundance. In terms of diversity, just over a thousand 
uh, recognizable taxonomic units, or were actually effectively morpho species. We'll just call them species. So a thousand odd species. Um, over the whole study, um, the, those are the numbers there that we got across the whole study. But again, we had the different numbers of sampling, a different amount of sampling effort. And you do always get just more and more species the more sampling you do. So again, I've given you the mean count per line um, in the graph there. Uh, for the malaise traps and the dark blue and the pitfalls and the light blue. And you, can, you see that the order changes a little bit. So the, the aparema actually had the highest total in the end um, per unit search effort, followed by the CAS, and, and slightly um, that was slightly ahead of the Ashley, which is quite interesting. And we played around a little bit with the CAS and the Ashley data only and looked at other diversity indices and so forth. And generally speaking, the CAS always had slightly higher biodiversity values and um, and slightly more even distribution, so fewer kind of dominant um, species affecting the data, uh, but only slightly compared to the Ashley. We can also have a look at the species community composition, and there's just a couple of examples of that. So on the left-hand graph uh, in the corner there in the blues, that's the um, the species composition or, that was collected by the two trap types, and it's exactly what you'd expect. So each one of these dots is the community composition of a, of a trap, an individual sample, and the closer together they are, the more similar the composition of that, those two things is, and the further apart they are, the less similar they are. So you've got the malaise traps clearly um, picking up a slightly different invertebrate community to the pitfalls, which is exactly what you'd expect. And the same thing, um, on the right, just with the three different river types or three different rivers. Um, and you can see there's a really obvious course level indication that the three rivers are, you know, have some slightly different communities going on, but there's also a lot of overlap. So there's probably a lot of individual, uh, there'll be a lot of species that are common across, in, across the systems and also quite abundant uh, across all of the systems that will be causing that. That said, half of all of the species that we found were only found on one of the three rivers. 218 on the Amp were only found on the Aparema, um, 197 on the Ashley, and 129 were only found on the on the Cass. So there is some some things that were only popping up there. This just shows the uh, like what's making up those communities. So this is um, the invertebrates separated out at order level, so we've got most of the insects or a bunch of insect orders there, and then we've got other things like we've got arachnids, um, and then the small like insect orders that didn't have many species I've clumped together in the brown, and then non-insect arthropods, things with jointed legs that aren't insects, and then other, which is like slugs and snails. Um, and you can see quite clearly that flies are really dominant in these diversity metrics, in, in, in abundance, sorry, which is kind of what we'd expect. Um, in the Ashley and the Cass, you can see the dark blue, that's the caddisflies. So you actually had some big numbers of caddisflies in those. And then um, the, the hemiptera, the troop, the sucking bugs kind of popped out as having a high abundance too. But so think of aphids, you know, when you get one aphid, you've got a, you got a lot of aphids. So that's probably um, why we're we getting those big numbers. Um, when we looked at diversity, so the number of different species in each of those rivers is a proportion of the total count for the river. The graphs are remarkably similar, which I think is really cool. It, it kind of says to me that the method that we're using is consistently picking up the same things in the same way. It kind of also says to me that only ever looking at order level um, data isn't going to tell you about the trends in biodiversity over time. Um, for your um, for your river, because you know, other one species or another is just taking over from from an, one fly is taking over from another fly, for example. Um, so I think that's that's quite useful. And if we this is actually data from the Tasman, that original pilot study that we based a lot of this off, that has almost the same graph again. So stack loads of flies, quite a few um, bees and wasps, mostly actually tiny parasitoid wasps. Uh, and then you've got your lepidoptera, your moths in the yellow, and then you've got things like beetles and spiders um, also coming in there at reasonable numbers of species. Because we've got all this data now, um, we're also starting to have a look at uh, the sampling effort and what it would mean to take out some of our samples or uh, use more samples, because we know that more sampling you do, more stuff you'll find. Um, so we did some probability detection analysis using occupancy models and things. Um, I didn't do it, someone else did it for me. It was quite interesting, basically, the probability of detecting a particular species in any one of your trapping lines on a sampling occasion 
was always less than um, 10 percent so um, basically things are rare you, you're not going to pick them up very often if we want to have a probability of over 50 percent detecting something that's there then um, we need a minimum of six lines to do that uh, but we also found that if you increase the numbers of pitfall traps or the numbers of pitfall of sampling lines uh, you didn't actually get a heck of a lot more bang for buck by increasing it, say, from five pitfall traps to seven pitfall, pitfall traps. Um, you know, the percentage improvement on what you were catching was, you know, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So um, I'm pretty happy, actually comfortable with five um, as a good number. If you go down to three, uh, it makes a big impact. You get a lot less out of them than if you add a couple more and go up to seven. I mean, as I said, that's because, like, most things are rare. You're not going to pick them up that often. So the more sampling you do, the more you'll find them. And we, I just threw this as a species accumulation curve in there to highlight that point again. So this basically tells you like the number of samples along the bottom and the number of species you count. And for the three rivers, which are in the solid lines, that's the actual data. So, um, you know, the more samples we added, the more things you'll catch. And you can see the difference in the sampling effort there because the Ashley with the blue line, um, that had twice as many samples. But you can see that those curves are miles away from being flat. You know, they're still going to keep going up. We could keep sampling forever. We're still not going to see every single species. And I don't think we have to. I think you get most of them in that kind of first 50 to 100. You get a good chunk of your biodiversity in that. And from there, you hopefully can extrapolate out and project like what's happening for biodiversity in general because uh, you've got a couple of hundred species that you're seeing there. The dotted lines are just some predicted um, numbers of species using some um, some models uh, suggesting like the actual number of species that might be there if we did do all that extra sample. So you can see like the CAS goes from 533, there might actually be 716 species there. So it's, that's just a one model that I picked out of a bunch just to show as an example. The other important thing around not just sampling effort but efficiency of running a, some kind of standard monitoring um, we often find people really balk at the idea of having to process samples. You know, it's like you catch a lot of bugs and now you've got to sit in the lab and do all this bug picking for forever. And it's a real limitation. People think it takes too much time. So we tracked how long everything took. Um, and even including the kind of learning hump at the beginning of all of this, when things took a long time, the malaise trap took about four and a half hours to sort, um, and each pitfall trap was about 20 minutes. So a whole pitfall line is about an hour 20 to sort all those different bugs. So a whole line of a one malaise trap and a bunch of pitfalls was basically about five hours 50, if my math is correct, uh, which I actually don't think is that bad. I think I was expecting it to be worse. So what have we achieved through this? We've now tested some reasonably standardized monitoring methods across four different rivers, starting with the Tasman, which was a whole bunch of other sampling methods, but the Cass, Ashley, and Aparima with just the two sampling methods. So we've tested that across four rivers. We've now got two to four years of basically baseline um, information on diversity and abundance and species composition. And that's, you know, that's a stack load more than we started with. So I think that's, um, that's good. That's a good outcome. We've also, because we identified everything down as far as we possibly could towards species level, we have a lot of fine-grained data that we can continue mining to refine how we use um, that information and how we interpret the information. Um, so, you know, there's a lot more we can do around looking at the, you know, the metrics that we use to, in the future, look at trend over time. Do we look at biodiversity or do we look at something else? I mean, diverse um, species richness or something else. We can look into are there particular taxonomic groups that are doing different things. We can look more into sampling effort. We throw a hundred more uh, pitfalls out there. Will it be worth worth anything or not? And sampling design. So there's always a hint I've found in these when I look at species composition. There's always a bit of a longitudinal um, effect. You can see that the different that further up the river you go, you get slightly different species composition. So that's always interesting. And the same, in, in, in time, you're always going to get fluctuations in the community, depending on what month you do your sampling. So in terms of that data mining, the things that we're doing now, um, we are going through a little bit of um, power analysis to really nail down like what's enough sample size to actually be able to detect changes over time if we wanted to, with confidence. 
I'm looking a little bit more into the taxonomic groups and the functional groups um, in the data set to understand if they're doing different things on different rivers or if the composition is different. So things like what's the ratio of detritivers versus herbivores of predators? What does the data say the spiders are doing? Because they're like the top predators in the invertebrate world. Um, <laughs> and then you've got like the beetles. What are they doing? Beetles are quite good because they cover all of the trophic levels you've got to tritivores, herbivores, fungivores, predators. And then can we find any like particularly good sensitive taxa that might be abundant enough to monitor over time, but um, sensitive enough to change that they're actually gonna tell us some interesting stories. So last slide, next steps. Um, I think we've done enough pilot studies fiddling around with data to be confident that we've got a method that we could call a standardized method that we can roll out a bunch across a bunch of rivers that we'd be fairly comfortable with. In terms of the detail, like all the stuff I've just talked about, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable with pitfall and malaise traps. I think they work well. I think they get the local scale stuff and you've still got the malaise traps getting in your freshwater invertebrate adults um, and your wider landscape invertebrates getting captured even though your line is just in one tiny part of the river. I think we should continue to try and ID things as specifically as possible. I don't think looking at water level or anything like that is actually going to tell you anything. You've really got to get into the detail if you want to understand diversity. In terms of the numbers of traps, the number we used seemed to be pretty good. Time points, I'd be, I think you could reduce it down. We did it monthly, November, December, January, February. You could potentially just do it before and after Christmas if resources were constrained. And you could potentially do like, uh, you know, three years on, three years off kind of monitoring. So you get those long time frames, uh, but you could maybe focus on a group of rivers each year, um, like Helen was talking about earlier on today, rather than trying to do everything everywhere all the time and not being able to do a good job. Um, and obviously there's, we'd obviously want to integrate this with all the other kind of monitoring that goes on, environmental monitoring and plants and birds and all the rest of it um, to kind of understand those interactions. So I think if you did all that with the methodology that we've tried out, I think we can get a fairly good, um, a fairly good data set telling us about the composition and diversity um, of these invertebrates on these um, braided rivers and it would be worth just getting on with it doing it, starting a time series so that, you know, we'll learn more by starting now, I think, rolling something out long term and, and being able to get to that point, you know, we've now done it for 20 years, what are we really seeing? We can tweak things as we go if we need to, but I think we've got enough to, to actually start that process and, um, yeah, see, see, how we, see how we go. Thanks. Yes, we, went, we basically did morpho species level. Yeah. yeah, so the pie charts just showed, um, yeah, at the order level. And that was really just to show that, cons you know, across all the braided rivers, you always get a third of your species are going to be flies, basically. But which flies is, is different. Yeah. A true bug. <laughs> yeah, a true bug is from the order Hemiptera. Uh, it's a sucking bug, you know, a, a, a sap sucking or, you know, like an aphid or a... Um, or an assassin bug, actually, they're not, they, don't, they don't suck plants, they suck other insects. So, yeah, things that have little sucky stylets. Yeah, I haven't figured it out exactly yet. Uh, it's on the, it's, you know, it's one of the many things that I'm still doing. <laughs> um, invertebrate diversity is, uh, invertebrates in New Zealand are mostly endemic. So the figure is, you know, above 80%. It's the same with most of our species in New Zealand, um, it's always very high. Uh, I do wonder with the Aparima showing such high, um, higher diversity levels than the other two rivers, um, I do wonder if there'll be more exotic species in that mix. And certainly that was the one place where we saw things like slugs and snails and worms that were introduced that we didn't really see at all on the Cass or the Ashley. Not out on the rivers, no. No, tussock grasslands is a different story, but out on the rivers, we don't tend to get them. <laughs>